Hi, gang. It's Patrick. And Adam. Coming up on today's super spooky episode, we celebrate Halloween, share some listener feedback, and discuss the final trailer for Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. We cover the latest Disney news, and we unveil a new segment where we discuss Disney legends. As always, we close out the show with some quick D. All that and more on today's episode of Gays Do the D. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Adam Candycorn Hummel. Oh, crossover. Why? That was what I was going to call you, Patrick Candycorn Kazaki. You pre plan my names? <laughs> always. Gross. I always like to have something in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that has nothing to do with pre-planning my name. <laughs> yeah. It's true, though. Yeah, I was going to call you Patrick Candycorn Kazaki. We can be Candycorn Queens. I like it. Okay. Although with those colors, orange and yellow, not flattering on me. I love my new Candycorn Minnie Mouse ears. Yeah. They're oh, super they're cute. so cute. Are you a Candycorn aficionado? Do you like Candycorn? I do not like Candycorn. Now, why is that? Is it the waxiness of it? I think it just doesn't really taste like anything other than sugar to me. And I'm just okay. like, well, if I'm going to have candy... And yeah. these calories make them count. <laughs> am I right? I guess. Yeah. Do you, do you like candy corn? I like the candy corn pumpkins, but okay. I don't like the candy corn. Do they taste different? They don't think they taste different, but <laughs> the the wax to filling ratio on a candy corn oh. is more noticeable to me huh. as okay. opposed to the wax seems less of an issue on a pumpkin because there's more filling. Okay. Plus, like, when have I turned down a larger dessert option? Fair, fair. So I'm, I'm pro-pumpkin. Candy corn? When did I have candy corn? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> a very Halloween Carol Channing? <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that and I'm here for it. Speaking of Halloween, Patrick. Yas. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Halloween, Adam, and to all of our Tweedledees. That's right. I'm so excited for this episode because we're doing something kind of spooky later on. We are doing something spooky, and it's not just in my pants. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't get the connection. It'll come to you okay. later. It'll all come right. to you later. All right. Well, are you planning on dressing up for Halloween? I'm planning on getting dressed for Halloween. Good. That's, that's... about. That's as far as I can get. <laughs> that's a win for everyone. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag rude? Yeah. What about you? Are you going to wear a costume? We're going to be recording on Halloween. We are. Are we going to wear costumes for no one, just for each other? I think so. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, we could really just describe anything, That's and true. people would just have to believe it, right? That's true. That's yeah. true. Maybe we'll take a picture. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like is for all of our Tweedledees out there to send us their pictures of their Halloween costumes. Yes, please. I'm certain there's some amazing ones out there this year. Amazing Disney costumes. We want to see them all. Any costumes, but specifically if you're wearing a Disney costume, send them our way. I only want to see the Disney ones. Fair enough. Yeah. I only want to see the nudes. <laughs> you can send us your photos of your fabulous costumes to our social media at GDTD Podcast. Or as always, you can email them to info at gazedothed.com. You cannot use a voice memo for the pictures, I imagine. I don't know how technology works, but I think it won't work. You can try. We also want to wish our listeners who celebrate a happy belated Diwali. Happy belated Diwali. What day does that fall on? It was on Sunday, October 27th this okay. year. Okay. A very funny episode of The Office, one of my favorite episodes where they all celebrate Diwali with Kelly and her family. Yes. Such a good episode. That is how I learned of Diwali. Oh, actually. really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I knew I bet a lot of, of people. It, yeah. But I didn't know what was involved in a celebration of Diwali. Well, I've seen pictures and, and videos of the dancing and everything. It's yeah. so beautiful. I love all the colors. Oh, it's amazing. The building I used to live in here in Minneapolis had a large Indian community in it. Oh, okay. And we had a party room in the building. Mm -hmm. And so it would always be rented out for Diwali celebrations. Oh. And the outfits that the women were wearing mm -hmm. were just gorgeous. Those deep, rich colors. And the food I was smelling I love smelled Indian food. amazing. So yes. very much. Yeah. So happy Diwali, everyone. Happy Diwali. So Adam, I'm so sorry. We skipped right over. How was your week this week? It was good. It was good. Good. <laughs> Patrick, I have a dog that eats other dogs' poop. Oh, my. She's doing that now. Hmm. I've so, read yeah. that it's because they're not getting some nutrient 
Oh, good, because I thought you were going to say, like, enough love or something like that. <laughs> Your dog, I think, gets a little too much love. I won't lie about that. Yeah. Because you shouldn't give dogs very much love. That's, uh, that's oh, what I've learned. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Good. No, I don't know if that's true or not, but I heard, like, maybe it's time to switch to, like, an older dog food or something. Oh, that's a good point. Who knows? I've also heard that bananas turn them off of it. Like what? eating bananas. I don't know. The woman who works at our doggy daycare. Yeah. Again, going back to how much love does my dog have? She goes to daycare. <laughs> but um, yeah, she said that bananas will turn them off it. And they also huh. have a product at the daycare that's called like no more eating poop or something like that. <laughs> and it's a chewable that you can give okay. your dog. I should try that. So <laughs> you should try that. It's getting to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, what can you do? How was your week, Patrick? Pretty, pretty good. I am ramping up for my trip for the Run Disney Wine and Dine event. It's coming up so quickly. How many days out up. are you now? Um, let's see. Well, I leave on Friday. Okay. Next Friday. Yeah. The first. And the run is on the third. Wow. I have one more day of training tomorrow, and then I can just wait <laughs> for the pain to come <laughs> on Sunday afternoon. Well, we'll all be cheering for you. Oh, thank you. Yes. And if anyone is going to be there in the parks, let me know. I would love to do some meetups, give you some gaze to the deep buttons, take some photos, all that fun stuff. How can they let you know if they're in the park, Patrick? Well, you can either DM the GDTD Instagram or you can DM me in my personal Instagram, Patrick Kazaki. I imagine I'll be posting pictures from both. And this trip, I think I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Don't hold me to it to get some audio. Oh, yeah. Maybe. So from the parks, we'll see what happens. I think you should record your entire run. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no one wants to hear me vomit. <laughs> I want a play-by-play of the entire experience. <laughs> It'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. I also did something fun this week. You did? I, I did. I went with our friends, Paul and Rick, to see Flip Phones. That is a sort of a local drag event company yes. here in Minneapolis. They had a Hocus Pocus drag dinner. Ugh. It was so much fun. Yes. I loved it. I've never been to a drag dinner before. I've been to drag brunches, but it <laughs> yeah. was so popular that they extended it another day and did a Monday night dinner. Wow. So drag at 530 with a turkey burger. I saw a picture of our mutual friend, Bart. Yes. Who was playing the role of Winifred. Yes. Bart goes by Loring Mitchell. And that costume, I'm telling you, it was like Disney theatrical level amazingness. She looked amazing. It was incredible. Yeah. Incredible. All the drag queens were super amazing. Let me give you a little run down of who was performing that night. Yes, please. So the host was Sasha Cassidine, and Bad Karma performed, Loring Mitchell, of course, and Jaden Dior Fierce from season seven of RuPaul's Drag Race. Well, how about that? Yeah, super great. She did a really wonderful Ursula outfit. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So the theme was Hocus Pocus, right. but there was a sub-theme of all witches are welcome here. <laughs> so the queens got to do kind of any witch they wanted to. That's fantastic. And then their final number was as the Sanderson sisters. Wow, that sounds amazing. It was really fun. I, I had a blast. It was, it was a great time. If you live in in Minneapolis or Minnesota in general, I recommend going to these flip phone events. They're super fun. Well, given how popular the Hocus Pocus brunch slash dinner was mm-hmm. this year, I would be shocked if they don't bring that back next year. I bet they will. And I have to say, I have to give a little shout out to well, all the queens, but Jaden Dior Fierce, I was noticing a lot of the RuPaul queens sometimes I've seen when they come through are sort of just resting on that they are a Ru girl sure. and not really giving me what I wanted. And sure. she was 100% high energy, such a good performer. I really enjoyed her performance. That's so good to hear. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Speaking of, the world wants to know, are you watching RuPaul UK? I'm not because we don't have logo. Oh, you know, you can get the logo app for free for a 30-day trial right now. Oh. You should do That's what we did. Well, maybe what I should do is just wait until it's over and then get the logo (laughs) app and just burn through all the episodes. Fair enough. I'm watching it, and I have to tell you, it's really good. Is it? I think it's better than the American version. The queens are just sort of campier and not going for just like runway. Glamour. Glamour and real woman aesthetic. They're so going for a camp. What I'm hearing is that you're supporting the UK over the United States. Why do you hate your country, Patrick? I'm a traitor. What can yep. I say? Yep. What can I say? Something super interesting before we move on is that it's on the BBC. Yeah. And so they don't win a cash prize at the end of it. There are no cash prizes because it's on the BBC. So it almost makes me think that these are queens who like for real just want to be there just for the love of doing drag and not for 10000 dollars you know what i mean well and the promotion right like oh for sure they're getting huge exposure in the country and for sure. around the world yeah i was talking to mikey and ben over at once upon a scream podcast which yeah. by the way listen to that podcast it's really good they're basically the uk version of us it's super fun <laughs> it's super fun and they, they were saying exactly that that they are gonna up their booking fees by a ton and that's yeah. worth it in and of itself absolutely mm-hmm. well i can't wait to check that out yeah man 
We have a couple of listener shout-outs we need to make this week, Patrick. We have some really fun ones this week. We sure do. We have to wish a congratulations to listeners Adam and Devin, who have also been sponsors on the podcast. Mm-hmm. They own Elevation Homes, and they sponsored our Madame Leota Funko Pop giveaway a couple weeks ago. True story. They are getting married this Friday, November 1st. I'm so excited for them. Yes. Congratulations, Adam and Devin. Where's my invitation? It got lost. I will be there on the 1st. <laughs> <laughs> for the cake. I will be in Florida. I might just pop over. Oh, why not? <laughs> just surprise them. I'm sure they'll love that. They would love it. <laughs> Congratulations, Adam and Devin. We also have another new listener. Her name is Nicole. She sent us a really lovely email. Would you mind if I read it, Adam? Please read it. Okay. It reads, Hey guys, relatively new listener here, longtime Disney addict. In your last episode, I enjoyed hearing about Disneyland from your perspective, but I was so dismayed that you didn't mention one of my favorite areas of DCA, Cars Land. Of course, we did not talk about Cars Land. Whoopsie daisies. Uh oh. Since this is a DCA exclusive land, I want to know all your thoughts about it. Personally, I think it's one of the most immersive and well executed spaces in any of the Disney parks, though I haven't been to Galaxy's Edge yet, so. The main street with the neon lights is straight out of the movie and so visually stunning at night. The food at the Cozy Cone Motel is so creative and delicious, and Mater's Junkyard Jamboree is low key one of the most fun rides at the park. Plus, Radiator Springs Racers, need I say more? Please give us your take on Cars Land. Also, next time you're in DCA, check out Corn Dog Castle. Best corn dog I've ever had, no lying. Thanks for the great Disney content and all the podcasting fun. You help fill my Disney craving when I can't get to the parks. Keep it up, Nicole. First of all, Nicole, yeah. let's just get the Corn Dog Castle thing out of the way because we did have Corn Dog Castle and it's amazing. It is amazing. We had a little pre Halloween parade snack. Mm-hmm. And by snack, I mean corn dog and chips and drinks. And, and by little, you mean huge because those are corn huge dog. corn dogs. So good. So we love Corn Dog Castle. Yes, it was delicious. But Cars Land. Yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know why we didn't talk about cars. I think it's because we just aren't huge fans of cars in general. And right. so it kind of escaped our mind. But here's what I'll say. As a non-cars super fan, you're right. It is a beautiful, beautiful, well-executed area of DCA. Yeah. And Radiator Springs Racers is an amazing ride. To me, Radiator Springs Racers is like a better version, a much, much, much better version of Test Track. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. It's so beautiful. And at night, it's gorgeous to look at the mountains. It really is. Man alive. Yeah. So, yeah, good call out that we didn't talk about cars. Thank you for taking us to task. <laughs> And thank you so much for the email. That was really lovely of you to send it to us. Thank you, Nicole. We appreciate it. Moving on, Adam, we have a couple of anniversaries to talk about. Yes. We've got four of them. I'll start with the youngest and go to the oldest. Okay. Turning seven, released on November 2nd, 2012, we have Wreck-It Ralph. Cute. I love Wreck-It Ralph. Moving on, Turning 16, released on November 1st, 2003, we have a movie I have never seen. What's that? Brother Bear. Oh, I've never seen Brother Bear either. We should watch it. My friend Steven says it's his favorite Disney movie. Really? Yeah. And who did the music for that? Was it Phil Collins, too? Did he do the Brother Bear music? I did not do my homework to look that up. I do know that Joaquin Phoenix, Rick Moranis, Michael Clark Duncan, and Estelle Harris are all voices in the movie. Oh, my gosh. I know. How have we not seen this movie? I may have aged out of it. I may have just kind of passed. That's that a good point. That's point a good point. In my life. Yeah, you were turning seventy three. <laughs> That's right. Around That's that time. right. Plus, when it wasn't like a full on character singing the music musical, mm-hmm. I sometimes would avoid the movies back in the day. Yeah. But now I have an appreciation for them, so we do need to go back and watch that movie. I should dig into what else was being released at that time to yeah. see if like something else was catching our eye instead of this movie. Mm. Who knows? Who knows? I don't also remember much marketing behind it. Right. And they don't talk about it in the parks very much. They don't. All right. Let's move on. Turning 18, released on November 2nd, 2001, Monsters, Inc., 18 years old. Wow, I can't believe that. Yeah, man. I love Monsters, Inc. Me too. Those characters in the park are so fun to meet when you see them. I also find the colors in those movies very appealing. Ooh, yeah. Like Sully's colors Mm -hmm. and Mike's combined. I just have a real appreciation for the art department when they're able to kind of pull together color palettes like that and keep them consistent from movie to movie. Yeah, sort of vibrant Easter colors that they're using. Good call, yeah. Thank you. And then last but not least, jumping way up, 42 years 
years old, released on November 3rd, 1977. It's a live action. Care to venture a guess? Oh my gosh. Um, Pete's Dragon? It is Pete's Dragon. Oh, how did I know that? I do not know. You're a wizard. <laughs> Pete's Dragon is turning 42 years old. Of course, starring Helen Reddy, Mickey Rooney, Red Buttons, and Shelley Winters. I was obsessed with this movie yeah. for a period of my childhood. Me too. It's why I was so excited for the new mm-hmm. release of Pete's Dragon, which mm-hmm. I liked, but yeah. the old one is just so much cuter and more lovable, I think. It's definitely charming. I was really surprised at how moving the remake was. Yes, it was a good movie. Like I was kind of blown away by it, mm-hmm. but I will say that the original obviously has a place in my heart because of the nostalgia value to it. Also, that song, what is it? I'll Be Your Candle on the Water? That's right. Oh, boy. It's so beautiful. It's really emotional. Helen Reddy. Mm-hmm. I am woman. Hear me roar. I know. I forget <laughs> about how like amazing she is. Yeah. She is kind of a queer icon. She is. Not that she identified as queer, right. but you know what I mean, in the community. Right. Yeah. Good job, Helen Reddy. Yeah. And happy anniversaries, Pete's Dragon, Wreck-It Ralph, Monsters, Inc., and Brother Bear. So, Adam, we have two movies to talk about that we got a lot of Tweedledee feedback from. Yes. The first would be Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. And let's quickly talk about the opening weekend box office, because when we saw it, the weekend hadn't finished yet, and so we don't know the number. We didn't know the numbers. Right. I'll start with the budget for the movie was an estimated $185 million, and the opening weekend in the United States was... $36 $36 million. Ouch. Not a great opening weekend. It's not a great opening. And I know from not great openings. <laughs> I'll tell you what, just to compare it a little bit, the original Maleficent had a $180 million budget, so roughly the same, and their opening weekend was just under $70 million, Okay. Which is a lot more respectable, I feel like. And then it had a cumulative worldwide gross overall of $758 million raked in. Okay. So maybe Mistress of Evil will hit those numbers. It's not looking great, though. It's not looking great, and it sounds like it's going to be bested by Joker again this weekend. Sounds like... Have you seen Joker? I haven't. I haven't either. I'm hearing very mixed reviews about it. I really want to see it. Yeah, I think I'll give it a shot, at least. Who knows? And then, just for one more perspective of a live-action Disney movie that opened this year, The Lion King had a $260 million budget and opened at $191 million over its first weekend. <laughs> Those are some crazy numbers. That's insane. And the comparison between the two is really sad. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to compare those two in particular. Of course, Just yeah. because Lion King is so revered mm-hmm, and loved, mm-hmm. and Maleficent is essentially a quote-unquote original movie. Yeah. You know, original story. Right. So I can see the difference there, but you're right, like that it's a huge disparity for two Disney films. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there you go, Maleficent. We then, of course, had some Tweedle the feedback. Do you want to jump into those? Yes, please. All right. Trina, who you can find on Instagram at Cook and Wah, said, I'm not well versed in all things Maleficent, but really enjoyed the movie. Good. That's good to hear. Robert from Instagram writes into us. He is Choo Choo Johnson on Instagram. Love that name. He says, I loved the new movie. I just kept saying yes with each new costume that came on the screen. It was visually stunning, I thought. I also think this one had way more heart than the first one. I might go back a few more times to enjoy it before it leaves the theaters. Wow, you really loved it. Yeah, Robert, they need your money, so that's, that's good. <laughs> oh, Keep doing that, Robert. Yeah, fair enough. Kevin, who you can find on Instagram at Mr. Kevy Kevs, wrote in to say, The costume department certainly knew what it was doing. I loved the gorgeous spectacle of this movie. The style, humor, and commitment to women in strong roles was all great. Well said. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that. Absolutely. Mark, Roger, and Kale, who are on Instagram at the Steamboat Willies, apparently they are one person now. <laughs> <laughs> They've merged. They're like those two Muppets on the old Muppet show who ran into <laughs> each other and became one Muppet. <laughs> They've merged into one voice. Just finished the latest episode about Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. Quick question. Do you two like any movies? <laughs> ha ha ha. Just kidding. Totally agree with Patrick. Give Mad Madam Mim her own movie. Oh. I'm going to assume that was actually Mark writing in because I think The Sword and the Stone is one of his favorite movies. Oh, is it? Yeah. And you're right. I am correct. (laughs) I am correct. (laughs) And last but not least, Anthony, who you can find on Instagram at AnthonyCRTZ, said, I loved it more than the first. Agreed. Same here. I think we both liked it more than the first. That's Love, right. Love's a strong word. It is a strong word. We don't throw it around all willy-nilly. <laughs> well, thank you, Tweedledees, for sending in your feedback on Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. Thank you, thank you. 
moving on, we were treated to the final trailer for Star Wars Rise of Skywalker last week. Boy, were we. Patrick, we need to talk about this trailer a little bit. We do, bit. we do. What did you think of the trailer? Uh, holy sh**. <laughs> 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 That's all I can say. <laughs> it, I mean, it gave me legitimate chills. Yeah. I watched it more than once. Uh-huh. I may have cried a couple of times. Yep. It's amazing. Here's my perspective. This movie is going to launch many midlife crises across <laughs> across the land because it's the end of a lot of people's era and officially childhood is gone. <laughs> it's just it's left away from us. <laughs> this is what we've been holding on to uh-huh. to it's keep a, us sane. Our last shred of childhood is, is being yanked. Uh-huh away from us oh my gosh yeah <laughs> you're probably right i feel exactly the same way i got chills watching this i full-on teared up yeah. several times watching the trailer yeah yeah just hearing that iconic theme music mm. played in kind of a more dramatic slower meaningful way yeah really moved me and then of course having c3po say i want to take one last look at my what <laughs> on earth is that about i think i have a theory behind that uh. i have a theory but we'll talk about that later okay maybe. but yeah i i was completely moved by it and i I think it's going to be a heck of a ride and I'm excited to see it with you and have the chance to talk about it on the podcast after it comes out. That's right. We are going to see it on December 23rd. Yes. I have to say real quick, whoever curated that trailer mm-hmm. needs a freaking award. Yeah. That was stunning work. I was like, well, that's all I needed. <laughs> I don't need to see the movie because I'm already emotional enough. <laughs> Well, tickets for Rise of Skywalker became available on Monday evening, right after the trailer debuted on October 21st. Mm -hmm. And within an hour, Patrick, ticket sales surpassed the record set by Avengers Endgame on the ticket sales site Adam Tickets. The Rise of Skywalker sold 45% more tickets than Endgame in its first hour. That's incredible. However, after the first 24 hours of ticket sales, The Rise of Skywalker was behind the first day sales for Avengers Endgame. So there was like a big burst during that first hour, and then it kind of leveled out. I've experienced that before. Have you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You might want to see a doctor about that. I'm, I'm good with it. Okay. <laughs> but what's interesting to note is that The Rise of Skywalker sold 2.5 times more tickets in its first day of sales compared to The Last Jedi, the last film in the Skywalker saga. That's incredible. And we heard from a bunch of Tweedledees about their thoughts on the trailer. We sure did. We had to call it down a little bit <laughs> and pick some of them because there were so many comments flying at us. First, we have Chad, who is on Instagram at Chubby Chadley, says, and I'm crying. (laughs) (laughs) I think it looks absolutely incredible, and I'm even more excited to watch the movie now. The final lines that Luke and Leia delivered absolutely destroyed me. I feel like this will be a fitting conclusion to the saga. Antonio, who you can find on Instagram at Prince Antonio eighty two love wdw. That's a mouthful. Just give us all the information, <laughs> Antonio, please. He says, "I am with you on it. I agree. It will be an emotional one." And he was responding to Chad's post. Oh, I, li- I like the conversations happening. Yes, in I our love Instagram. it too. <laughs> Kevin on Instagram, Mister Kevy Kevs. It's my favorite name in the whole world. <laughs> Mister Kevy Kevs says, "I love how grounded it feels. There is a grit and humanity to this sequel trilogy that." definitely makes me feel more connected to these characters as people. I have confidence things will wrap up with, dare I say, a new hope. Look at you, Kevin. With the puns. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Paul, who you can find on Instagram at jpaulfinlay, said, wow, just wow. When C-3PO said, taking one last look, sir, at my friends, it hit me so hard emotionally. Yes, one last look for all of us Star Wars geeks to say goodbye to our far, far away galaxy friends. Some poetry from Paul. I like that. I'm just trying to like (laughs) get a tissue because I'm going to cry after that. Brooke writes in on Instagram, Lowen Brooke, I am shooketh. Oh, (laughs) she pulled out the old timey English. I love that. (laughs) No hate, but if Ray and Kylo don't at least kiss, I'm rioting. (laughs) (laughs) This is amazing. Also, I've got a feeling that either Chewie or C-3PO is going to die. Rude. That is the worst thing you've ever said to me. That is rude. We are blocking you from Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. If that does happen, though, I'm, I'm going to lose it. What, the kiss or the dying? Both. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I want to see kiss? Uh, I sure do. Finn and... Poe. Ben Poe, yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, let's make that Poe happen. Nope, that didn't work out so well. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> 
Mario, who you can find on Instagram at Diamond in the Rough Clothing Co., says telling a finale that has to appease decades of waiting, countless hours of storytelling, fan speculation, and characters we have grown to love is a tall order. I believe that regardless of how the film series ends, many diehard fans will be upset. I don't envy the task of trying to wrap this series up, but the images that have been posted look epic, and the finale will try to exceed any other battle scenes we have seen. That is true. It better bring it. And I'm sure it will. There has to be tremendous pressure on the creative team behind this film to deliver. Yeah, I mean, people are going to hate no matter what you put out there. Right, so right. I think it'll be great, though. I have high expectations, and I think they're going to be met. Toby on Instagram at TTG writes, I should remember to stop cutting onions while watching Star Wars trailers. <laughs> mm-hmm. I see you. I see you, Toby. <laughs> and last but not least, Paul, who you can find on Twitter mm. at Paul Posts, says, this made me so damn emotional. That was in all caps. Oh, I BTW. like that. Yeah. I get so emotional, r 2 d 2 Nice try, Patrick. Thank you very much. Nice try. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker opens domestically on December 20th, 2019. I see you went with the Empire music, the Darth Vader theme. Well, I'll be running for the dark side in April for the rival run weekend. Speaking of running, Patrick. Yas. Don't you have something to tell us? I do. I ran this past week and it was fun. That's not what you have to tell us. So I decided to start a blog about my experiences running with Run Disney. Yes. And I'm going to try to make it a little bit GDTD friendly so it's connected to what we're doing here on the pod. Mm -hmm. We're just doing another medium, another blog medium. Yes. Like I said, it's going to be all about my adventures with running, my ups and my downs, my highs and my lows, and maybe some tips and tricks that have helped me along the way. Never an authority on running. I would never call myself that, but just something for new runners or old runners or baby runners or teenage (laughs) runners. (laughs) So hopefully enjoy along their journey with running as well. Where can listeners find your blog? So you can find it directly by going to patrickrunsdisney.com, or you can find it linked to our gays do the d website at gays do the d.com i read your first post and i thought it was fabulous oh thank you that's very generous of yeah you. i love how you laid everything out kind of described your experience and also what you're hoping to achieve with the blog yeah here's the thing folks i'm not a professional writer by any stretch of the imagination i just sort of write with my voice so if you're looking for great grammar go somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> and if you're looking for me basically speaking with my fingers and words then come here it's not American Sign Language. I'm not speaking with my fingers and hands, but you know, you know what I'm saying. I know exactly what you're okay, saying. Okay, great. I okay, think it's great. really exciting, Patrick, and I'm excited to learn all about your experiences with Run Disney. Thank you very much. Before we throw it to the news, we have to put a call out for questions. So in next week's episode, former Walt Disney World cast member Kristen is going to be joining us, and she's going to be telling us about her experiences working with Walt Disney World, first with the Disney College program, mm-hmm. and then as a cast member, she was friends with... Bell mm-hmm. in the parks, and she was also friends with Rapunzel. So exciting. She has a lot to tell us, and we can learn a lot from Kristen. So what we'd love to do is have listeners write in with questions for Kristen about her experiences as a face actor in the parks, mm-hmm. and also just her experiences in general working for Walt Disney World. I also want to be sure to give all you parents out there with kids a fair warning that we are going to be going behind the magic a little bit. Keep that in mind if you're going to listen to next week's episode with your children. Some behind-the-scenes magic will be revealed. So as you all know, you can reach out to us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at GDTD Podcast, Or you can always email us or send us a voice memo to info at gazedothed.com. And while you're sending us those questions, go ahead and send us some questions and Peter Panzer's questions because we're going to be doing a Questions and Peter Panthers episode in a couple of weeks. That's right. So we've got questions for Kristen and questions for us. Adam, I have a question for you. What's that? Can we please talk about the news? Let's do just that. Hooray! For any of our Tweedledees who aced our Walt Quizney episodes, Disney is looking for you. Disney Plus is launching an untitled new quiz show, and they are currently holding an open casting call. They're looking for families of four, consisting of siblings, cousins, spouses, in-laws, etc. The only real stipulation is that the four contestants must be related either by blood or by law somehow. All contestants must be at least eight years old, and an adult of at least 18 years old must be the person applying. If you are interested in applying, you can visit theoldschooltv.com slash currently dash casting. 
Patrick, are you going to enter? Do you have four family members that you feel confident enough in that they would be able to support you in a Disney trivia type game show? Not that I'd want to spend more than an hour with <laughs> at a time. But... Well, the holidays are coming, so you are <laughs> already Uh-oh. in trouble. I don't know. It could be fun, don't you think? I think so. Are you going to apply for it? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I have no real desire to be on TV. And in a game show situation, I think it would be very uncomfortable for You me. would be so good on it, though. I think I could be good on it, maybe. We have to find a way to get related <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'd be unstoppable exactly <laughs> patrick do you know what the disney look is <laughs> i'm going to serve you a disney look right oh, now across the table oh it's not good it's <laughs> not good what did i what did i do to you it's unsettling <laughs> <laughs> anyone who has been to a disney park knows the company has strict appearance standards for cast members from chairman and chief executive officer bob Iger to parking attendants employees must adhere to the disney look which is loosely described patrick as a quote friendly classic appearance interesting the disney careers page describes the disney look as a classic look that is clean natural polished and professional and avoids quote cutting edge trends or extreme styles it is designed with our costumed and non-costumed cast members in mind our themed costumed cast members are a critical part of enhancing the experience of our disney show and our non-costumed cast members also play an important role as representatives of the disney brand regardless of the position you hold with us when you take pride in your appearance you become a role model for those around you and you convey the attitude of excellence that has become synonymous with the disney name Mm. it's interesting our very first guest janice Mm. was talking about this because she was part of the disney college program as a cast member yes and she recently got married she did congratulations janice and patrick okay back to the news (laughs) so for many many years men had to be clean shaven right and Mm -hmm. then mustaches were allowed and in 2012 the guidelines for facial hair went right out the window patrick (laughs) when male employees were allowed to grow goatees and beards while on vacation to eliminate the appearance of stubble Mm. (laughs) as long as facial hair was kept to a quarter of an inch in length. That's very specific. It's very specific. Well, on October 28th of this year, the guidelines are being eased once again to allow cast members to grow facial hair up to an inch in length but again, visible stubble is still a no-no. A whole inch? Can you imagine? You give them an inch, they swim all over. That's my Sebastian. So, so good, Patrick. <laughs> In addition to the easement of facial hair guidelines, cast members can also now wear a single bracelet and a single necklace. Previously, cast members could only wear rings, earrings, and a business-style wristwatch. So you can now wear one vial of blood around your neck. That's right. Just okay. one, though. Got it. Angelina, Jolie, are you listening? <laughs> uh, what great news for hippies. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go hog wild They're with this. They're going to go wild. All of those hippies with an inch-long beard. I'm that person who would push this and be like, and wear the most obnoxious bracelet in the world. Oh, <laughs> you would not. I would, for sure. It'll be so loud. Literally loud. It'll play music. <laughs> Right. You're like, look at my bracelet. <laughs> that jangly <laughs> sound. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll sound like Dolly Parton. Like she wears all those. It's Yeah. Yep. So no crop tops yet. Huh? No crop tops yet. We'll get there. Okay. One day. Keep the dream alive, people. <laughs> <laughs> Aim high. Aim high. <laughs> Come, little Adam, I'll take thee away <laughs> into a land of sequels. Uh, what are you singing about? A, a little Hocus Pocus news has oh surfaced. Gosh, I'm so excited. So according to Collider, a sequel to the 1993 cult classic Hocus Pocus is finally happening. Jen D'Angelo has been hired to write the script for Hocus Pocus 2 on Disney+. Plus. D'Angelo was a writer and co-producer on Workaholics, such a funny show. She was also a writer and producer for L.A. to Vegas and Happy Together. She was an associate producer for Game Over Man, and she appeared in the Facebook series Loosely Exactly Nicole as Veronica. Unfortunately, this is all we know so far. No expected release date has been set, nor has it been confirmed whether or not the original film's stars will be involved. Though you can find in many interviews, Bette Midler, Kathy Jimmy, and Sarah Jessica Parker have all said in the past that they would love to play the Sanderson sisters again. 
It should also be noted that in 2017, rumors were flying about a possible remake of the movie, either on the Disney Channel or Freeform, but it would not include the original cast. That all quickly fizzled out. So hopefully, more will be announced soon, and we will be sure to keep you informed as information is released. This is being prepped for Disney Plus? Disney Plus is what they're saying. Collider broke this story, and everyone else is sort of piggybacking on what they said. So we don't have much information, nor 100% confirmation, but no one has denied it yet. Specifically, D'Angelo herself has not said, no, this isn't happening. What was the fate of the Sanderson sisters at the end of the first movie? Winifred was turned to stone, right? And then exploded, I think, because the sun came up. That's right. And weren't Sarah and Mary exploded as well? Yeah, I think they were on their (laughs) brooms or vacuum cleaners or whatever it was. Yeah. But, I mean, they were resurrected in the first movie as right. well. So who knows? Maybe they had a backup spell that we didn't know about. Right. So who can say? Very exciting. Although we also don't know whether or not it'll be the Sanderson sisters in Hocus Pocus. Right. We, we know nothing about it. A completely new story. Yeah, for sure. What do you think it should be called? Hocus Pocus to a muck a muck a muck. <laughs> there you go. You just yeah. it. I like it. Yeah. I like Resurwitchen. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Or just Hocus Pocus part two. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, don't you think? <laughs> I have a couple of Star Wars stories for you, Patrick. Uh-oh. First, an update on a story we reported last week. I'm happy to announce that Walt Disney World's Galaxy's Edge Docking Bay 7 food and cargo menu item names have reverted to their original Star Wars themey goodness. You can thank us, I think. That's absolutely correct. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. Our reason was not given for the backtrack, but I have to believe it was my passionate plea. <laughs> That's right? exactly what it Don't was. Don't you think so? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. You're welcome, everybody. I can get my tip yips now. <laughs> <laughs> also, your next trip on a Star Speeder 1000 may take you to a surprise destination. Star Tours The Adventures Continue, the ever popular simulator attraction developed by Disney in partnership with Lucasfilm and Industrial light and magic will feature new and exciting destinations beginning december 20th 2019 which as we know also happens to be the opening date for star wars the rise of skywalker what as with the releases of the force awakens and the last jedi which saw star tours taking unscheduled trips to jakku crate and batu the rise of skywalker's release will coincide with your star speeder 1000 making a detour to the ocean moon of kef burr which is what we saw in the trailer and they're fully going to play just the last scene of the movie. So That's they right. ruin it for everyone who's on that ride. That's right. Can you imagine? <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> I would kind of love it. I'd be like, oh, what? I really love Star Tours, and it is kind of a must-do for me on every trip. Mm. It's a successful ride in that they can bring in these new scenes and keep things fresh yeah, and interesting mm-hmm. and keep people coming back for more because they want to see the new planet or the new destination that the Star Speeder goes to. I always get the Jar Jar Binks one every single time. You do the underwater I, one? I do, yeah. Oh, I love when we go to the Wookiee planet. Mm-hmm, That's mm-hmm. my favorite. It's true. Have you ever been the Rebel Spy? Several times. Oh, brag much? <laughs> in fact, several times in one trip. Oh, yeah, so lucky you. You're serving looks. I'm serving rebel realness. <laughs> Welcome to the Star Wars Hour. I have <laughs> another Star Wars news segment for you. So Star Wars fans who have dreamed of designing a droid outside of the Build-A-Droid experience at Galaxy's Edge, of course, may now have the opportunity of a lifetime. Lucasfilm's Star Wars Force for Change and the global robotics community, first, have teamed up and created the Build My Droid Contest. The contest is intended to inspire the next generation of innovators in science, technology, engineering, math, and creative arts, a.k.a. STEM. Anyone age 16 and up can submit the design for a droid that will be featured in a future story set in the Star Wars galaxy. This is all, of course, leading up to the final chapter in the Skywalker saga, Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, which opens in the U.S. on December 20th, which we've said 47 times in this episode so far. You got that, people? You got it? (laughs) Write it down. We're not going to say it again. (laughs) They all have tickets already. (laughs) It's true. It's true. And the winning designer will go to the world premiere in December to witness the public unveiling of their droid design on the red carpet. Are we going to design a droid? Obviously we are. It's going to be fabulous. Uh, 
Uh, it's going to be real cute. Just like rainbow-colored <laughs> glitter <laughs> nightmare. I love it. <laughs> so even more exciting, the panel of judges for this contest includes Star Wars creature and special makeup effects supervisor Neil Scanlon, Lucasfilm vice president, creative producer John Swartz, Lucasfilm senior creative executive Pablo Hidalgo, celebrity Star Wars fan and STEM advocate Mayim Blossom Bialik, and the first founder, Dean Kamen. The Build My Droid contest is now accepting submissions. Applicants must turn in their droid design in the form of a sketch, drawing, or painting by November 13th, 2019. Official rules and info can be found at StarWars.com slash BuildMyDroidContest. Six isn't a judge? Six is not a judge, nor is Joey Lawrence. (laughs) Strangely enough. (laughs) But Blossom is. (laughs) For those listeners who use the incredibly popular fuel rods to keep their mobile devices charged while in the parks, I have some disappointing news. I'm so upset about this. (laughs) Beginning November 1st, 2019, fuel rod swaps at both the Walt Disney World Resort and the Disneyland Resort will no longer be free and instead cost $3 per swap. Wow. Since their arrival in the domestic Disney parks in 2016, fuel rods have been popular with Disney guests. An initial purchase of a fuel rod starter kit for $30 entitled guests to unlimited free rod swapping. I'm into that. Did you want to touch that free rod? I I have multiple times. Multiple times. Fuel rod kiosks at locations outside the resorts like airports and Universal Resort have already implemented a charge for swapping. So yeah, upsetting. $3 per swap now when you need a new battery. It should be noted that this is not a decision by Disney. This is Fuel Rod doing this changeover. They are just in the parks. Disney is not necessarily making any money off of this. So do you still intend to use Fuel Rods, or are you just going to purchase a separate bank like through Amazon? I will still use my Fuel Rod because I can recharge it myself at home. So I'll just bring another charging unit with me in case it runs out of juice. Great plan. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm a planner, but no longer a rod swapper. I think you're still a rod swapper, if you know what I mean. Uh, I am in that sense, but I'm just going to hold on tight to my own rod and oh. not swap it out for someone else's rod. But I will be charging $3 if you want to use my rod. Seems like a high cost to use your rod for $3. This is the second time you've insulted <laughs> my fuel rod in <laughs> this episode. I'm insulted. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Adam. Hey, Patrick. You know, I was doing some thinking lately. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Only bad things happen when I do some thinking. That's right. And I have two thoughts. Okay, what's that? First thought. Yes. Let's talk about something spooky for Halloween. Yes, please. For our main segment. We need to get into the Halloween spirit. We do, yes. Second thought is, I'm very bored with our conversations. Oh, oh no. (laughs) We are beating a dead horse with all of our segments. Okay. Just kidding. I love all of our segments, but I think we need to spice it up a little bit. Yes, I would love to spice things up. Let's do a new segment here on Halloween. I love it. Fabulous. Great. Okay, so Tweedledees, Mm -hmm. we are going to start talking about Disney Legends. I love this idea so much. Thank you so much. I'm very wise. Mm -hmm. Our new segment, which you came up with, makes me laugh. It's called On the DL. (laughs) (laughs) Do you like how I say that? I do. (laughs) You're kind of like a little shy about it. A little 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 sensible about it. Mm -hmm. Do we need to explain what On the DL means? I think we do in gay culture anyway. Okay, mom, close your ears. (laughs) (laughs) So when someone's on the DL, it means that they're basically not out in the gay community Mm -hmm. or in the LGBTQ community. Or to their families in general, I would say. That's right. And they may be exploring their sexuality. Mm Mm-hmm. Without being out and maybe not telling their husband or wife or whatever. And Interesting. We'll just leave it at that. You got very scandalous with it. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> but here yeah. on the DL means on the Disney Legends. That's right. We're going to be talking about Disney Legends, which I think is a great idea, Patrick. It was your idea to come up with this segment. Well, I'm very smart. You are very smart. And 
I think a lot of times as Disney fans, we kind of know the names of Disney legends, mm-hmm. but we can't necessarily pinpoint what their contributions were to the company. Mm-hmm. And so this is a great opportunity for us to explore that part of Disney's history. Well said. I have to admit, I kind of got this idea from our friends over at the Disney Buzz. They do a quick segment, I think every episode, where they chat about a Disney legend. And I oh, thought, yeah. what if we just explored that a little deeper and did a whole show about it? So we should maybe explain to our Tweedledees at home who don't know what a Disney legend Legend is. Yes. So back in 1987, Disney basically started a Hall of Fame for people in the Disney community. So it could be an actor from a Disney movie, a voiceover actor, Imagineer, designer, what have you. Fred McMurray was the very first Disney legend back in 1987. Actor Fred McMurray? Actor Fred McMurray from The Shaggy Dog. From The Shaggy Dog from My Three Sons. Mm-hmm. Although that was not Disney, but yeah. I used to watch it on Nick at Night. Stop talking about things that aren't Disney, Adam. You're right. My it's bad. not going to happen. My bad. You can't sit with us. <laughs> so we won't talk about Fred McMurray today. We'll save him for a later day. Yes. But you had the wise idea to maybe theme today's Disney legend on the deal episode to people involved with the Haunted Mansion. It's the spooky season. It's our Halloween episode. We need to talk about that amazing, fantastic, fabulous Disney attraction, the Haunted (laughs) Mansion. And so I thought, yeah, let's talk about some legends who worked on that ride of all rides. I love it. And it's very apropos because this is the 50th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion. It certainly is. Well played, Adam. So what do you say I kick you in the DL first? (laughs) <laughs> what? If I say yes, does that mean you're just going to give me some information about a Disney legend, or am I actually going to get kicked? We're going to find out live here on the podcast. Okay, yes. Cover up. <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> My first Disney legend I'm going to talk about is Yale Gracie. Yale Gracie. Amazing. Amazing. Such a rich backstory. So Yale Gracie was inducted into the Disney Legends Hall of Fame in 1999 under the categories of animation and engineering. Now, see, that's already interesting to me because I would just assume that he would have fallen under the Imagineer category, which is a category of legend. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he worked in animation and I didn't know he was an engineer. Well, that's my whole story. Okay, you're done. Moving on. Good job, Patrick. (laughs) Thank you. Yale Gracie was born on September 3rd, 1910 in Shanghai, China. What? Yeah. After graduating from an English boarding school, he then moved to the United States where he attended the Art Center School of Design in Los Angeles. Amazing. Amazing. Already really cool story. Yeah. He joined the Walt Disney Studios in 1939 as a layout artist for Pinocchio. He was also a layout artist for Fantasia and the art director for The Reluctant Dragon. One of your favorites. He's responsible for that gay dragon. (laughs) God bless ya. And he worked on roughly one million animated shorts for Disney. Oh, sure, yeah. Including most of the Donald Duck shorts. So this guy's right up my alley. He is right up your back alley. Uh Uh-oh. Probably not. I think he was married, but maybe on the DL. On the DL. (laughs) We brought it full circle. Oh, we did. So he did this for about 20 years until 1961 when he was hired on as a special effects and lighting artist at Walt Disney Imagineering, which was called Wed Enterprises at the time. It's said that he got this job with no specific training as a special effects artist beyond his own curiosity and experimentation. So he was known for just sort of tinkering around with little tools from the offices and seeing what he could build. In fact, one Saturday, when nobody was in the office, Walt Disney himself happened upon Yale's desk to find mock-ups featuring an illusion that made snow fall. He was so impressed, he offered him a job to help research and develop attractions for Disneyland. Because he had no formal training, he learned on the job and was constantly experimenting to create the most realistic illusions. Walt did that a lot. He and did, you're going to hear yeah. that a lot with these legends, particularly who worked in Imagineering or behind the scenes, mm-hmm. was that he just saw things in people. Yeah. And he then offered them the training to become kind of masters in their fields. Yeah. It's so smart. And I wish more employers did that these days Mm. it's kind of like you're automatically pigeonholed into companies yeah and not really allowed to explore other options and Walt was so great about doing that yeah he was a master at sort of teasing out people's passions yeah and saying well if that's what you're passionate about that's what you should be doing yeah so little touches of yales can be found all over disneyland and disney world he worked on the endless steam coming out of the mad hatter's teapot Mm. the fireflies which we were talking about in the blue bayou oh so great before yeah just before the main portion of parts the care and they're yeah. so beautiful. He also worked on the volcano effect in Peter Pan's flight. 
Most notably, Yale is responsible for many of the ghosts in the haunted mansion, including the busts that seem to follow you as you move, the singing busts, and of course, my favorite illusion, the ghosts in the ballroom scene, using a technique called Pepper's Ghost, which he got from magician Henry Pepper. He also, these are some really fun side notes, he worked on the flames of the burning city in Pirates of the Caribbean, and apparently at the time, the flames he created were so real, the fire department insisted they build an emergency off switch, so if there was ever an actual fire, they could tell what was real and (laughs) what was fake. He also worked on the Carousel of Progress for the 1964-65 World's Fair. For that attraction, he created a pixie dust projector that created the illusion of pixie dust on stage during the scene changes so you couldn't see what was happening, which then was used in Space Mountain to block out the roller coaster structure while you're on the ride. Oh, sure. That is so fascinating to me. Yeah. Little things like that you don't even think about that someone had to come up with. Right. Just all this magic that's around you and the rich history behind it. This is really, really fascinating. So it's Yale Gracie's fault that there's just enough starlight (laughs) on the coaster structure that I'm afraid I'm going to hit my head. Yep. Thanks, Yale. Thank you, Yale. (laughs) So this, of course, is just a small but amazing list of his accomplishments for Disney. He retired on October 4th, 1975, but continued to consult for Disney, specifically on Walt Disney World and Epcot. After his retirement, not much was known or written about Yale. He was fairly private and never really sought out the spotlight. Tragically, I'm going to try not to get choked up because this really makes me sad. On September 5th, 1983, he and his wife, Beverly, were staying overnight at their cabana at the Bel Air Bay Club in the Pacific Palisades neighborhood of Los Angeles when someone broke in and shot Yale in his sleep, killing him and injuring his wife. Whoever shot him was never found, and there was no known motive. Super tragic ending oh, to this guy's so tragic. life. It's just, I'm welling up a little bit here thinking about it. It's just such senseless, senseless yeah. acts that, I, that make me so mad. After Yale's death, however, Mark Davis was interviewed, and I really liked this quote from him. Here was this guy who created all these magic things. If you wanted fireflies, this was the guy who would figure out how to do them. He was the guy who created the fire effects for pirates and the magic effects for the haunted mansion. All of that was Yale Gracie. He was a great guy. I never drink a Manhattan without saying, here's to Yale, because that's all he drank. He made an enormous contribution to the Disney attractions. It was a great loss. It's really hard to read. (laughs) It makes me really sad. And of course, maybe the best tribute to the life of Yale Gracie can be found outside of the Haunted Mansion, where Ex Atencio created a headstone that reads, Master Gracie, laid to rest, no mourning please, at his request. So beautiful. It is. I'm fully crying right now thinking about that. (laughs) These guys loved each other so much. Mm -hmm. It can be seen all over Disneyland, but there's a lot of really beautiful tributes to the Disney Imagineers in the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, you really get a sense of the respect in that kind of brotherhood and sisterhood of the Imagineers. Exactly. And yeah. kind of what they went through. I mean, they were working together countless hours a day oh, to kind yeah. of make the parks happen. And it really shows in their kind of camaraderie. And doing it all for the enjoyment of other people. Right. It's so beautiful to me. Right. So well done, Yo Gracie. Thank you so much for your contributions. Well, Patrick, I'm going to change things up a little bit. Why don't you perk us up a little bit with a better story? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to bring a lady into the mix. Ooh. And the lady I'm bringing into the mix is Leota Toombs Thomas. I was hoping you were going to cover this. Leota Toombs Thomas. You know, there aren't a lot of women associated with Imagineering at it's Wet true. Enterprises. I think a lot of people immediately think of Mary Blair, of course. Mm-hmm. But Leota Toombs was there, too. And we often think of Leota attached to Madame Leota in the Haunted Mansion. Or unattached. (laughs) Oh, she ain't got no body. (laughs) Leota, who was known as Lee to her Mm. friends, was inducted in 2009 in the Legends Award category Attractions and Imagineering. She was born on August 9th, 1925 in Glendale, California, and she began working for the Walt Disney Studios Ink and Paint Department in 1940. Oh, man. And as we all know, the ink and paint department was crucial to the Walt Disney Company, and it was one of the few opportunities for women to join the company. In fact, a lot of women were employed in the ink and paint department because they needed to paint realistic makeup effects on the characters. Yeah, we, of course, celebrate the artists mainly Mm -hmm. when we think about these iconic characters. But behind the scenes, these women were doing the most astounding work that really brought them to life. Not long after Lee began working for the Walt Disney Studios, she was trans 
transferred to the animation department, and that is where she met animator Harvey Toombs, and they married in 1947. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. That is really cool. Yeah. In fact, it's quite the family affair. I'll get into that in a little bit, but Ooh. it continues. Like Mary J. Blige, like, family affair? <laughs> just like that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Lee left the Walt Disney Studios to raise their two children, Lonnie and Kim, and Kim would herself become an Imagineer in 1970 and work for the company to this day, and she is currently the director of concept design at Walt Disney Imagineering. That I did know, and it's such a cool lineage. Yeah. In fact, maybe Kim will be a Disney legend someday, too. I bet you. It's just crazy to me that... It continues in this family line. Mm -hmm. A lot of creativity. Yeah. So Lee returned and joined WED Enterprises, now known as Walt Disney Imagineering, in 1962. And she created and developed designs for the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair, including elements for It's a Small World and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln and Ford's Magic Skyway. Wow. Yeah. She touched all of the attractions, basically, that Walt Disney brought to the World's Fair. She touched Abe Lincoln. (laughs) She touched Abe Lincoln. (laughs) She was best known for her mom. Models and final pieces for attractions like Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room, Pirates of the Caribbean. She did a lot of sculpting for pirates and Haunted Mansion, of course, and Country Bear Jamboree. Yay. In fact, there's really cool YouTube videos out there where you can see Lee sculpting wow. faces for Pirates of the Caribbean. Ooh. It's really cool to watch. And I'll mention some of the YouTube videos specifically in a bit. And they made multiple animatronics for each of the characters, didn't they? Or like at least multiple heads just in case they broke down? I would assume that they would have made multiple skins yeah. for the robots just because why not have some at the ready in case anything should happen for sure for sure so as i said before we all know lee as madame leota in the haunted mansion and how did she land the role that's kind of an interesting story Ooh. lee once recounted quote as i remember my eyes were the right distance apart <laughs> to fit the test model when the whole thing began that's hilarious Completely due to her eyes. And Lee's daughter and Disney Imagineer Kim Irvin described the process for the creation of Madame Leota, stating, quote, When Yale Gracie, Patrick, mm. was experimenting with ideas for a gypsy in a crystal ball, he asked Leota if she would mind posing for the head. They were a close-knit group, and Mom said she thought it sounded fun. Blaine Gibson made a life mask of her face, and Yale, Waffle Rogers, and the rest of the team filmed her, crazy makeup and all. I still remember when she wore it home that night. (laughs) Then they created the little Leota bride at the end of the ride. Since that figure is small, they wanted a high voice, so they kept mom's voice because she sounded like a little girl. What? I did not know that. So that is actually Lee's voice you hear at the end of the ride. No way. Yes. And as we mentioned before on the podcast, Madame Leota's voice was provided by actress Eleanor Audley, who also voiced Lady Tremaine in Cinderella and Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty. Mm-hmm. Isn't that cool that when you're at the end of the ride, you're hearing Lee's voice? I love that. When a new Madame Leota sequence was required for Disneyland's Haunted Mansion overlay, featuring Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Imagineers asked Kim to be her mother's replacement. Apparently, they looked so similar that the Imagineers were able to film Kim and then project her face onto her mother's life mask. That's so cool. That is so, so cool. And Kim has often commented that her mom would just love that, that it's like her mom's face, but then Kim's face projected on her mom's face. That's so beautiful. I love that. Lee moved to Orlando in 1971 to help build Walt Disney World's team that maintained attractions and shows and also worked on the attractions for Tokyo Disneyland. She moved back to California in 1979 and worked at the WDI Show Quality Service Department at Disneyland, where she trained artisans and designers in the staff, paint, and sign shops. I just love that, that like after her career and everything that she learned working for Wet Enterprises, she was unable to go back to California and teach the next generation everything she knew. That's amazing. You will see that a lot with a lot of these Imagineers and designers, that they just they stay with the company forever. And it makes sense that they would teach the next generation, right? Because Mm -hmm. everything that they were coming up with was completely original. Like there was no manual for these things. (laughs) Right. Yeah. They were just designing things on the fly. And so it makes sense that they would then convey to the next generation how to make these things work. She had worked with original art directors like Mark Davis, Mary Blair, and John Hench. And as I said, could teach the new Imagineers about their styles and the nuances that made the scenes and characters work. In fact, one of the young Imagineers she trained was her daughter, Kim. I love that. Kim said, it was a unique situation to be trained by your mom. She was a wonderful teacher and friend. Anyone who knew her loved her, and many Imagineers owe some of their success to her for passing on their tribal knowledge that is so important to our product. 
Leota Toombs Thomas died on December 21st, 1991. Kim said that her mom, quote, always laughed that of all the things she had designed and created in her career, the one she is best known for is Madame Leota. <laughs> and as I mentioned, you can see Lee in action on YouTube in the video Disneyland from Pirates of the Caribbean to the World of Tomorrow. And that came out in 1968. It features a 1965 tour of Wet Enterprises by Walt Disney with Julie, Miss Disneyland Tencennial. <laughs> it's really a hoot to watch. And you can see Lee sculpting at the 609 mark. Wow, I'm for sure going to check that out. Yeah, it's great. I mean, just to be able to tour wet enterprises at all is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. But it's really funny to watch Walt lead this kind of young, attractive woman (laughs) around wet enterprises. And he refers to the Pirates of the Caribbean as Blue Bayou Lagoon. Like, that's what he says the name of the ride is going to be. Oh, wow. He kind of gets, like, flustered and lost. Oh, buddy. Yeah. But (laughs) it's really great. Anyway, so that is Leota Toombs Thomas. Who's next on your list, Patrick? I am going way back in Disney history with Harper Goff. This is way, way back. Way, way back. One of the originals. Yeah, a lot of people say that beyond Walt Disney himself, Harper was the original Imagineer, basically. Mm. Wow. He was inducted into the Disney Legends in 1993 under the categories of film and Imagineering. So Harper was born on March 16th, 1911 in Fort Collins, Colorado. He later moved to Santa Ana, California and attended Chouinard Art Institute in L.A. He later moved to New York as a freelance illustrator in magazines, including Esquire and National Geographic. When he moved back to California, he worked as a set designer for Warner Brothers. Some of his credits there include Casablanca, Charge of the Light Brigade, and Captain Blood, starring Errol Flynn. He was also an art director for Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure, for sure. A fun fact, during World War II, he was approached by the Army to help them develop camouflage. He created what was essentially a paint-by-numbers kit that would become standard issue. That's so cool. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Man alive. In 1951, Harper was at the Bassett Loke Limited shop in London where he met Walt Disney. They were both interested in buying the same model train set, which is super cute. A quote from Harper about this experience, he turned to me and said, I'm Walt Disney. Are you the man that wanted to buy this engine? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I almost fell over. He asked me what I do for a living, and I told him that I was an artist, and he said, when you get back to America, come and talk to me. He did just that, and he was hired by Walt Disney to develop movie and imagineering projects for the Walt Disney Company. What a crazy, crazy happenstance. Can you imagine, like, running into Walt Disney and then getting a job? I can't, first of all. (laughs) And also kind of going back to what I said before, too, isn't it weird how he just got a read on people, Walt, I'm talking about, immediately, and just knew that they would be able to kind of help him realize his dreams. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible to me. He had an instinct and an eye that I think is why the company was so successful. Absolutely. So some of Harper's accomplishments for Disney include the design for the iconic Nautilus submarine for the film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. A fun fact is that 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was initially only supposed to be a true life adventure short. But after Walt Disney saw Harper Goff's sketches and storyboards, he knew there was something special there, going back to what we just talked about. And 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea became the Walt Disney Studios' first produced all live action film made. Made in the United States because of Harper Goff's renderings. Wow. Amazing. A side note, that movie won two Academy Awards for color art direction and best special effects. However, at the time, there was an art director's union bylaw within the Academy that said only union art directors could win the Academy Award. So the award was given to Harper's assistant, John Meehan, because he had a union card. Harper eventually got a union card, but was never given the award. That's dumb. (laughs) Well said. That is really well said. (laughs) So then Harper played an enormous role in designing Disneyland, including Main Street USA and the Jungle Cruise. He was also involved in designing the layout of the World Showcase in Epcot, and he did concept designs for the Japan, Italy, and United Kingdom pavilions. 
So going with our Haunted Mansion theme, in Harper Goff's early renderings of Disneyland, he included a sketch of a crooked street leading away from Main Street into a church and a graveyard with a run-down manor on a hill. Does that sound familiar? It does sound familiar, except for the run-down part. Mm, That's true. It's true. It's true. (laughs) So Walt Disney grabbed onto this idea and sent it on to Imagineer Ken Anderson to create a story using Harper Goff's idea. So we kind of owe (laughs) the Haunted mansion to Harper Goff. Goff would work on and off with Disney until his death on March 3rd, 1993, at the age of 81. You know what's interesting to me about this kind of idea of a haunted mansion that Walt always wanted in the parks Mm -hmm. is that a majority of the Imagineers that he kind of tasked with concepting the idea Mm -hmm. all sent him back drawings of like a really run down dilapidated house which is what everyone thinks of as a haunted mansion yeah but what we ultimately got was like this pristine in Disneyland anyway southern you know New Orleans style mansion Mm -hmm. because Disney didn't want an ugly house in his parks yeah right which is cool which is really cool and very smart of him Mm -hmm. but I just love looking back at all of the concept art that Harper did and that mm-hmm. Ken Anderson did because they're all like these rundown houses exactly what you think of when you think of a haunted mansion yeah for sure and Patrick we had the privilege of seeing them I was just gonna say that on our trip to Disneyland it is so cool if you are in Disneyland I think it's still up there's a little sort of museum if you will on Main Street that has a lot of the old renderings and sketches for the haunted mansion it is adjacent to great moments with Mr. Lincoln it's kind of a separate lobby area for that attraction That's right. I feel like we might need to do a full episode dedicated to the Haunted Mansion one of these days. It is such a cool, storied attraction in the Disney parks. Beyond any of the other attractions, I think it has like the richest history behind it. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Well, I'm going to close us out with another major contributor to the Haunted Mansion. Hooray! And that is Rolly Crump. Oh, of course. Rolly was inducted into the Disney Legends in 2004 for Imagineering. Rolly's full name is Roland Fargo Crump. That is the <laughs> coolest name that's ever happened. <laughs> he was born on February 27th, 1930 in Alhambra, California. And he was a dipper in a ceramics factory and actually took a pay cut to join the Walt Disney Studios in 1952. Wow. He was very eager to join the Walt Disney Studios in 1952, but he was not paid a living wage at the time. So he actually built sewer manholes on the weekends. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, boy. (laughs) He originally served as an in-between artist and then an assistant animator and worked on films like Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, and Sleeping Beauty, along with many, many more. In 1959, Rolly joined show design at WED Enterprises and worked on The Haunted Mansion, Enchanted Tiki Room, and The Adventureland Bazaar. Rolly was highly regarded by his peers in Imagineering, despite being one of the younger members of the group. In fact, he was maybe the youngest of the group. And when I was going back and watching some old clips of him on YouTube, mm-hmm. kind of hot. <laughs> I have to admit, like, he's very smart and kind of soft-spoken. Mm-hmm. But again, he's one of these Imagineers that was kind of a jack-of-all-trades yeah. and was really into kind of figuring out how things work or how to make things work. Mm-hmm. Really fascinating stuff. Disney concept designer John Horney. Uh Uh-oh. Do you want to touch that, Patrick? Nope. Okay. Okay. John Horney noted that Rolly has a knack for bringing out the best in others. Trusting their talent, he encourages artists to push their creativity to the limits. It's a rare creative person who can let others run with the ball. That's a really true statement there. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of creatives are like, no, 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 no. I have the correct answer. Show writer John Steinmeier commented, quote, the idea is king with Rolly. It doesn't have to be his vision as long as it works. I love that. So this is a guy who is on board, right? Like he loves the idea. He loves the concept. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be his. He doesn't need the credit for it. He just wants to see it fulfilled. That is great leadership. Rowley worked on the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair attractions and designed the Tower of the Four Winds marquee for It's a Small World. Have you ever seen the Tower of the Four Winds, Patrick? Mm -mm. It doesn't exist anymore. I was going to say, I don't remember seeing that. It was kind of the quote-unquote weenie or icon for the Disney attractions at the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. It was quite likely one of the tallest structures at the World's Fair. Wow. And it was a kinetic sculpture, so it would capture the wind and make things spin. Not unlike you see in the current 
different version of It's a Small World, the facade anyway, at Disneyland. Sure. That's not really kinetic. It's all run on motors. Right. But it's that same kind of concept. Okay. Rolly hated it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he hated how it turned out. Aww. And when it was discussed whether they were going to bring the Tower of the Four Winds back to Disneyland, it was decided they wouldn't because of costs. Walt actually really loved it, but Rolly was really happy that it was dismantled and quite likely <laughs> melted down for scrap. He was like, that's going to be too expensive. Why don't right. we just do something else? <laughs> For It's a Small World's permanent home in Disneyland, Rolly designed the animated clock at the attraction's loading area, which features a parade of children at each quarter hour. I love that. For Haunted Mansion, Rolly was paired with Yale Gracie to come up with concepts for the attraction. He was very much inspired by Jean Cocteau's 1946 film Beauty and the Beast. Ooh. It's a black and white film. It's very artistic, very cool. Mm -hmm. And Rolly came up with concepts for The Candleman, which we saw a drawing of in Disneyland, Patrick. Oh, and it was terrifying. Very scary. Yeah. He also came up with a concept for a talking chair. Weird. Yes. And you actually see ideas of these in the Haunted Mansion, although they're not fully realized. Okay. So when they were pitching the Haunted Mansion to Walt, they gave a four-hour presentation, and it was led by Imagineers Claude Coates and Mark Davis, who were kind of the main designers at the time of the Haunted Mansion. Right. And Rolly's concepts were actually behind Walt during the presentation. So they were in this giant conference room. They had Claude's presentation at one side. They had Mark's on the other. And Rolly's were just kind of tucked away. <laughs> Again, he was a younger member of the group, right? Yeah. I'm imagining like a Mad Men boardroom situation That's exactly here. what I was thinking, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And after Claude and Mark were done, Walt said, well, what's this behind me? Yeah. And then Rolly was allowed to pitch his ideas. And you have to remember, at this time, the Haunted Mansion was going to be a walkthrough experience. Oh, right. And you weren't going to be in doom buggies yeah 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 so roly pitched his candle man and his talking chair mm -hmm. and walt was really a fan of roly's despite him being so young and the next day walt said to roly roly you son of a gun i didn't get an ounce of sleep last night because of all those sketches and concepts you showed me yesterday they were so weird oh funny and that weird statement is what led to the Museum of the Weird, mm -hmm. which was originally going to be attached to the Haunted Mansion and a walkthrough experience after you got off the ride. I wonder if they'll ever recreate what would have been. I know. Wouldn't I, that be cool? I've thought about that a lot. Wouldn't it be cool to have like a Museum of the Weird restaurant attached to the sure, Haunted Mansion? Sure, 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 yeah. Because there's so many great concepts that we saw, Patrick, that could be utilized today and just be so cool. I bet there are some hidden gems within the Oddities store that oh, is sure. the Haunted Mansion store in mm -hmm. Disneyland, because that's got a very creepy vibe to it. It does. Creepier than the Haunted Mansion itself. Yeah. So I, I want to like go through that with a fine tooth comb one day. Rowley went on to contribute to the initial designs of the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World. He also developed story and set designs for NBC's Disney on Parade special in 1970, after which Rowley left Disney to consult on projects including Bush Gardens in Florida and California, the ABC Wildlife Preserve in Maryland, and Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus World in Florida. Wow, that's really cool. Like the other Imagineers we've previously mentioned, he returned to Disney. They always come back, don't they? Mm -hmm. He returned to Disney in 19. 76 and served as project manager for the Land and Wonders of Life pavilions at Epcot. He was also part of the master planning for an expansion of Disneyland. In 1981, he left Disney again to lead design a proposed Cousteau Ocean Center in Norfolk, Virginia. He also launched his own firm, Mariposa Design Group, for which he oversaw the design of themed projects around the world. In 1992, Rowley returned to Imagineering as executive designer. He redesigned and refurbished the land and innoventions pavilions at Epcot. Rowley, quote unquote, retired from the Walt Disney Company in 1996, but continued to work on a number of creative projects. His autobiography, It's Kind of a Cute Story, was released in 2012. You can see Rowley on YouTube in The Wonderful World of Disney, Disneyland 10th Anniversary, telling Walt and again, Julie, Miss Tencennial, <laughs> about the Museum of the Weird at the 720 mark. In 2012, Rowley spoke with the Walt Disney Family Museum about his experience working on the Haunted Mansion and had this to say, quote, It has probably been a couple years since I last visited the Haunted Mansion. I don't get down to the park much anymore, but when I think of the Haunted Mansion, I truly feel that what we had designed was fine and worked out great. I wouldn't change anything about it. We all did a beautiful job, and I don't think it could get any better than that. 
I mean, it could get a little better. <laughs> I have some suggestions. <laughs> you have notes, I have some notes for these on geniuses <laughs> on their attraction. That's funny. I love I love the use of the word fine. When yeah. in my head, it always is like, it's fine. Right. But like, he means it. Like, it's fine. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I love that. All of these people, just enormous amounts of energy and time and creativity put into building this amazing attraction. But then mm-hmm. also there's all these little tidbits you didn't know about how they were hired yeah. or how they worked together. You know, it's fascinating to learn about these people that have really contributed to something we love so much. It's true. When I was reading about Yale, it was hard not to find sentences that also included Rolly because yeah. they sort of partnered up on their work for the Haunted Mansion. They were definitely paired up for the concepting part of it. Like mm-hmm. They were partners for that portion of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. It was really cool. Well, I have to say, Adam, this has been a real mistake. I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't like it yeah. at all. Yeah. No, this was really fun. I, I think we should definitely keep doing this. Yes. I love learning about these these people and uncovering these facts, things I just had no idea about. Yeah, it's a fun little Disney lesson for us. It sure is. So we'd love to know what you think about this new segment, maybe some of the contributions that we talked about from our Disney legends. And also, I'd love to know what legends you want to know more about. Maybe you have some good theming ideas for us that we can group some Disney legends up with. Yes, please. Yes, please. Tell the kids at home where they can send us their ideas, thoughts, and suggestions. You can reach out to us on social media at GDTD Podcast. And everybody say it together. You can always email us at info at gays do the D. Do you know what I wish? What? That we could have like a dinner party with all of these old Disney legends from days gone by. Yeah. Can you imagine going to the bar with them? Well, you have to remember back then you could probably drink at the office too. So it was like you didn't really have to go to a bar. You just were drunk by the end of the day. Well, apparently all Yale drank was Manhattan. (laughs) So he and I have that in common. Patrick Candycorn Kazaki. <laughs> Adam Candycorn <laughs> Hummel. I almost called you Kazaki <laughs> because we're going to apply for the Disney Quiz That's show. That's right. We got to get married. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Sorry about it. <laughs> he, he would understand for that prize uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. Mm-hmm. It's everyone's favorite time of the show. Hit me with some quick D. And this week we're going to do Quick D Classic. That means Quick D Question. Ooh. And for those listeners that don't know, Quick D Classic is when Patrick and I ask each other a question we have not been privy to prior to recording, and we answer it off the cuff. That's right. It's very improvisational. Ooh, I like how you said that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Patrick, yes. I think you should go first because, per usual, I have not prepared a question, and I'm hoping that something brilliant will pop into my mind as I'm answering your question. Yes, and I don't think it will. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. What is your question for me, Patrick? My question for you is I want you to elaborate Mm. on the droid we're going to build for Build My Droid. Serve me up some GDTD droids, won't you? (laughs) I will. Okay. I feel like I have the vision and (laughs) the technical ability to really pull this off. And I have nothing to bring to the table. (laughs) That's correct. (laughs) Got it. That's correct. Got it. So here's our droid, Patrick. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, I want it to be completely covered in rainbows, (laughs) completely covered in glitter perfect yeah but i think should have a very fit male form Mm. just because that will keep us motivated on the project okay yeah so it's like a lisa frank sexy frank (laughs) situation (laughs) that's exactly right cool 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 it is an lf in fact this could be its name because they all have names like this it is an lf dash sf That's the name of our droid. This LF is dash, dash the, SF. It doesn't roll off the tongue, but you know what the I best mean. thing that's ever happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of glitter. Maybe there's like a unicorn tattoo. Great. Somewhere. I'm not going to say where. It's like a hidden Mickey. Right on its booty. <laughs> right on you its just, booty. You just told us. You just told Which us. is going to be prominent. <laughs> You know? That bubble butt droid. Yeah. Like, not so jacked that it's, like, veiny. Yeah. But, like, it's got to have a nice form. Good. Good. What's its function? What does it do for us? Interesting, you should ask. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Do I want to know? Is this safe for families? This is going to be safe. Okay, good. It brings us cocktails. It brings us cocktails. I didn't think you were going to stop at that first word. That's, oh, well. 
<laughs> it brings us cocktails and desserts, and it brings you Mickey pretzels when you request them. Oh. It brings you all the popcorn you can eat. It's basically contributing to our alcohol and food needs. I feel like you directed that right at me with the Mickey pretzels and the popcorn and the cocktails, and I thank you for your service. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I, done here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no longer needed. I thank LFSF for its service as well. I am very proud of you for just <laughs> letting that roll off your tongue like that. Like, well, I have a good strong tongue. I struggle. <laughs> <laughs> do you think we could win uh yup i think we could win can you freaking imagine if they were like uh we gotta we gotta make this <laughs> this is the best one we received the only one it yeah, had to it had yeah. to be the only one all the others are trash no yeah that was the only one they received and then like they have to put it in like a star wars show like can you imagine if lf SF <laughs> just like strolled into the Mandalorian at like in a bar and was like, I'm like, hi, hey, <laughs> cocktails, anyone? I have a Mickey pretzel. <laughs> Manhattan, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a shot. I think we do. Okay, good. <laughs> well done. Good. Well played. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mm-hmm. My turn. Uh oh. Patrick, as you mentioned in your news segment, there is going to be a Hocus Pocus 2, we there think, is, yeah. anyway. It's happening. It's coming to Disney+. Plus. We don't yes. know any of the details of it. Mm-mm. What I need from you is a full-on plot <laughs> for Hocus Pocus 2. Run wild with this thing. Like, Let's hear all of your dreams come true. Hocus okay. Pocus 2, go. Okay, it's uh, Hocus Pocus 2, mm-hmm. You Got Some Splainin' To Do, <laughs> <laughs> is the title of the movie. It opens up so many doors to, uh-huh. to storylines. I yep, love it. Yep, it's, it's starring... Lucille Ball, obviously, oh. <laughs> and Ricky. <laughs> so they really do have some explaining to do. You got some explaining to do. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh huh. It's all set in that Cuban restaurant, uh, and at least that's where the the intro starts. Okay, all right. Uh, it's an old I Love Lucy. It's more of a prequel. Yeah. Actually, because I, I feel like Lucy was the original witch. Oh, okay. I like that it opens up the opportunity to explore dead people. Like, <laughs> you've already now said, okay, Lucy and Ricky are dead. Yeah. So are the Sanderson sisters, as far as we know. Yeah, they So now exploded. it's like, now it's there. The possibility's there for them to come back. Yeah, it's going to be a lot more horrific than you want it to be. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a real zombie a- apocalypse situation. Is it the first rated MA program on Disney Plus? <laughs> it's going to be. It's going to be Disney Plus After Dark. <laughs> Disney Plus XXX. <laughs> Disney Plus No Kids is what they're calling it. <laughs> Disney Plus Drinks. So as I said, yeah. Lucy and Ricky are involved. Great. Uh, because Lucy was the original witch along with Ethel. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm, they were mm-hmm. the OGWs. Yep. Yep. It's going to be a lot of uh, chocolate conveyor belt shenanigans mm-hmm. happening and yeah. grape stomping shenanigans happening. Yep. Great. That's actually how the witches get created in the first place uh-huh. is grape stomping. Oh. <laughs> So it's not just wine. It's wine and witches. It's wine and witches. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a really fun party, actually. I was say, it's we like should a, do that, a wine yeah. and witch party. So what you don't know about that episode, mm-hmm. when Lucy and Ethel were stomping grapes, they actually slipped and broke their necks <laughs> and died. That's how they died. Went straight to hell. <laughs> Met the devil and became witches. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Where were standards and practices? How did this get made? It wasn't around. <laughs> Not a thing. Not a thing. Oh. Yeah. So we later learned then that Lucille Ball yeah. is Winifred Sanderson, that red hair man. My mind is blown. It's floating right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a real easy script to tease out from this description. It's basically done. Yeah. Just run it through Gina Davis's <laughs> system of checking it to make sure that everyone's we've accounted for. We've got Ricky Ricardo, we've so got, we've got some ethnicity there. We've got Ricky. We've got women in the leads. Tons of women. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> I Great. like this idea. How does it end, you ask? <laughs> How does it end, I ask? Is It's sort of a Captain Marvel situation where we all learn that women have witch power in them. I love that. Kind of like the end of Buffy as sure. well. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, and then they all die, oh. Adam. They all die. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it delivers Yeah, the, on wor- the world fronts. ends, and yeah. then only Ricky's corpse rises up and says, Hocus Pocus, you got some explaining to do. Blackout. Great. Mm-hmm. Great. What do you think? <laughs> Is this how I get into the Disney Legends? <laughs> I... I... <laughs> Listen, I don't want to squash your dreams, but no, no, 
This is not how you get into the Disney Legends. This is not how you improv, Adam. You but, say yes, and but do you know what? Two awards. This is how you ensure that our friendship will continue. Yeah, because I am full on crying right now <laughs> from the idea that this this is where Hocus Pocus is going. Yeah, yeah. I think we all saw it coming. We all. <laughs> That will do it for this episode of Gays Do the D. Thanks for listening. To become a patron of the podcast, visit our website at gaysdothed.com slash donate. For a donation of any amount, you can receive exclusive Gays Do the D content and help us continue to bring you the very best Disney news and discussion. Continue the conversation after this episode on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast. Submit your questions or show ideas to info at gaysdothed.com. Have a great week, everybody. See you real soon. Thank you.